Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. This is Quick Study Television Weekend Edition. And this program takes you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's very exciting. We do this every year and it's fun. And Corey, you're going to help us figure out what we're going to study today. So what are you bringing to us? Well, today we're going to be looking at a few places that King David would have frequented. We're going to be looking at the Mount of Olives and also a tiny little fragment from Jerusalem that tells us a lot about its history. Very interesting, the Mount of Olives. Fascinating stuff. I've been there many times. That's excellent. What are you going to study from science today? Well, today in Science Rocks, we're talking about the world's greatest balancing act. The world's greatest balancing act. That's fascinating. Well, today in the teaching segment, we're going to be talking about the following. As we look at it, we begin to ask the question, and we answered the question, that David discovers through prayer, God is displeased. First in our historical studies today, you and I are going to be looking at Jerusalem, the city that David conquered. But some would say that it wasn't a city when David conquered it. It was more like a small village. Well, what does history have to say? Recently, a tiny piece of an ancient tablet was discovered in an excavation in Jerusalem. It preserves Akkadian writing that has been dated to around 1400 BC, making it by far the earliest writing to have been found in Jerusalem. Due to the small size of the broken clay document, it's impossible to piece together what it said. However, it is clear that it was of top scribal quality, and it has been noted how intriguingly similar it is to the famed Amarna letters. The Amarna letters refer to clay tablets that were a part of Pharaoh Akhenaten's records, dated to around 1400 BC. They were written by kings of surrounding cities and nations. A prominent figure in the Amarna letters is Abdi Haba king of pagan Jerusalem, who is credited with writing six or seven of the discovered letters, and is mentioned by name in at least one other. The letters from this king of Jerusalem have been specially noted by researchers to be of a particularly high scribal quality, and they also portray a picture of a thriving, industrious, well-established Jerusalem smack dab in the middle of the time period of the judges. Biblically, this works. We're told that the people couldn't oust the Jebusites from Jerusalem. And King David gained special renown in the Bible for his conquering of this city, which he then chooses as his capital. The problem has arisen, however, that there has been almost nothing found archaeologically of this Amarna period city. Without the Amarna letters from Egypt, the Bible would stand alone in its description of Jerusalem before David. That is, until now. If this small clay fragment is what it seems to be, then it too proclaims, albeit quietly, that Jerusalem was indeed once a capable administrative center with a happening scribe. Questions and critical thinking are good things, even and especially when it comes to the scriptures. And historians have to ask tough questions about the scriptures and about the history that it contains. Uh, did this history actually happen? And they look in the past, not only using other ancient written sources, but also using what they find in the ground through archeology. span Now, this is not a perfect process and for very obvious reasons. Uh, not all written uh, records and documents 
documents have survived to today. In fact, only a very small fragment and, and, and fraction of all ancient written documents have survived until today. And the same goes for physical remains, just through the wears and tears in time of time, and also through forced invasions as well, and, and uh, uh, purposeful destructions of cities. Archaeologists and historians have lost a good deal of information. Now, with all of this in mind, it's amazing how much history has been reconstructed that goes hand in hand uh, with the Bible. The Bible is a theological logical book and it is a book containing history as well. It does not contain exhaustive history about uh, all of the characters and figures mentioned in it. It gives us what we need to know for the purposes of the authors. And in the case of David, we need to know a lot because he is one of the founding kings of Israel. And as far as his life goes, uh, it is faring very well in historical and archaeological observation. Answers to prayer are real. Our prayers to the God of heaven and the God of earth are heard. In fact, real proper prayers change the order of heaven. We read in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, that the prayers of the saints are before God. Now, the story in 2 Samuel 21 is interesting, not only because it's about answered prayer, it's also about a national disaster that can only be resolved through prayer. David seeks God in prayer and he discovers the truth behind the famine. We never learn how long David waits to get the answer to his prayer, but we do know that God resolves the famine once Israel's violation against them is proclaimed. Second Samuel 21, verses 1 through 14. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Now, therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, As for the man who consumed us and plotted against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose." And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Meholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. Now Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock, from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. 
and she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Jabesh-Gilead who had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul in Gilboa. So he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from there, and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son in the country of Benjamin in Zelah, in the tomb of Kish his father. So they performed all that the king commanded, and after that God heeded the prayer for the land. 2 Samuel chapter 21 verses 1 through 14. This is an amazing, interesting story today as we read the Word of God and trust in the Bible. Now, the Bible is 66 books by 40 authors, and God has prepared for us today this story. Our steps of faith are absolutely fascinating. As a matter of fact, I call this God Answers Finished Prayer. God Answers Finished Prayer. Now, what does that mean? God answers finished prayer. Well, that's a good question. Our reading is 2 Samuel 21 to 24, and we're looking at 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 14. And as we look at that, we need to ask God, show me, Lord, show me exactly what you want me to see. And so let's get right into the scripture because this is important. 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 2. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered and said, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. And so the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn protection to them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Now, this is interesting. David discovers through prayer that God is displeased because Israel has violated their covenant. We must keep our covenants, beloved. When we say something, we must do what we say, and we must say what we do. Now, this is very important in today's world because people are saying a lot of things with email, Facebook, and Twitter, and LinkedIn, and all the rest of them. People are just saying things like crazy. But it's important for us to do what we say and say what we do. So what does that mean? That means that you and I, beloved, we are people who need to watch what we say. We need to put a guard over our mouth. Actually, that's something that the Lord will do, Psalm 144. Put a guard over our mouth, O God. Now, the Psalms tells us this. When we talk about all of the things we're involved with, you know, social media and speaking and everything, Lord, put a guard over my mouth. Very, very important. Be careful what you promise. Now, listen to this. Therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance for the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, we will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, whatever you say, I will do for you. And then they answered the king, as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth. He was the servant and the son of Jonathan and the son of Saul because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. And so the king took Amri and Mephibosheth and the two sons of Rizpah and the daughter of Ai, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michael and the daughter of Saul, 
who she brought up for Adriel, the son of Berezali, and the Mohathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell. All seven together were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, this is amazing. David fulfills the request of the Gibeonites. David fulfills the request of the Gibeonites. We must do what our broken covenants call for. Understand, David did not break this covenant. He didn't do that. But somebody else had done that. But they were bearing the cost of the broken covenant as a people of Israel. This is so important. Beloved, we must take responsibility for things that have been violated. We must take responsibility and say, Lord, help me to do what's right in this situation. Beloved, that's so important today. Really important for us. Let's go on to verse 10. Now Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. This is interesting. From the beginning of the harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day or the beast of the field by night. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. And then David, he took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jebesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul and Geboa. And so he brought the bones, brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son there. And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin in Zelah and the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all, all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. Beloved, so important. David follows the proper burial rituals for Saul and Jonathan following Rizpah's cue. God answers prayer when we obey him. David fulfills the covenant. And then God does this for David because David says, I am going to get those bones back and I'm going to bury them properly. This is such an amazing plan that God performs for this particular time. Beloved, we need to do that to set the record straight and to make right the things that are wrong. And beloved, this is so important today. We must remember to fulfill our covenants. There is a moment in the life of King David where his son has launched a rebellion against him and David is forced to leave Jerusalem, his capital city. Now, the Bible tells us that this pathway leading out of Jerusalem took David over the Mount of Olives. This Mount of Olives has been the scene for many a biblical event. The Mount of Olives is a mountain ridge just east of the city of Jerusalem. As an important protective feature and lookout point for the capital city of Israel, the Mount of Olives has appeared in several important moments recorded within the Bible. The first mention is with no surprise connected to the king who founded Jerusalem, King David. It is a mournful account from 2 Samuel 15. David's son had launched a rebellion, and to save his life, King David walked out of Jerusalem with his court, weeping and lamenting as he climbed the Mount of Olives to lead the city. It is interesting to note here that the claimed Messiah of the New Testament, Jesus, a descendant of King David, entered Jerusalem before the Passover, coming back from the way David exited. Jesus rode on a donkey as prophesied in Zechariah 9, down the Mount of Olives and into Jerusalem, while people shouted praises from Psalm 118. During this last Passover of Jesus' life, the New Testament documents that Jesus would spend his days teaching in the temple complex and his nights outside of the city on the Mount of Olives. 
When paired with a prophecy from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, this detail becomes intriguing. In Ezekiel 11, verse 22 and 23, the glory of God is seen to leave the temple complex and rest on the Mount of Olives. The New Testament also details Jesus' teaching on the future that he gave on the Mount of Olives, and it names the Mount of Olives as the place of Jesus' ascension into heaven. According to the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, in the last days, God will descend upon the Mount of Olives and use it in a very intriguing way. At Quick Study Television, our passion is to help you learn and understand the Bible along with us. Our goal for 2016 is to expand to new television and radio stations, add more helpful materials to our website, and continue to produce innovative products to help people of all ages study the Bible. None of this would be possible without our faithful partners, both financially and prayerfully. Thank you so much. If you are currently not a partner of Quick Study, would you prayerfully consider teaming up with us so that we can continue teaching the Word of God? If you would like to become a Quick Study partner, please call our office in the U.S. at 724-733-8336 or in Canada and the rest of the world, 519-940-8338 or write to us. And remember, no gift is too small. Thank you for staying with us right here on Quick Study Television. Corey and I are here to tell you that if you're keeping up with us in the Bible, that's great. Remember, next time on Quick Study Television, I'm going to be talking about David's son, Adonijah. Proclaims himself a king, but I thought Solomon was supposed to be in there. Well, we'll find out what's happening more next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, have you ever wondered why you can take a jog or play sports and not become dizzy like you can while taking a plane ride or riding on a roller coaster? What is it that makes the difference between these internal motions and external ones? Well, it's actually a very small organ in your inner ear called the vestibular organ, which receives messages from your spine. Let's study. Throughout life, the human body undergoes a great deal of movement and motion, from walking to running to riding in cars and planes, or even roller coasters. Everyone is in motion. But how is it that those engaged in voluntary movement, such as running, do not experience the dizziness of the passive riders of a plane or roller coaster, who have no control over the sudden changes in speed and direction? What makes the difference? The answer is found in a small organ located in the inner ear called the vestibular organ, or VO. The VO is responsible for maintaining balance and posture during voluntary motion. According to researchers, the VO senses ongoing self-motion and ensures that the person unconsciously compensates for the accompanying changes in the orientation of the head. In other words, it has a dampening process which lowers sensitivity when the body itself causes motion. Without this dampening function, intentional body movements would disrupt balance. It was a team of German researchers from Ludwig Maximilians University who first discovered how this organ and whole elaborate system works. Using tadpoles as an experimental model system, since the tadpoles' balance organs operate on the same principle as a human's, they found that as the tadpoles began to swim, their spinal cord sent out two copies of the swim signals. One copy goes to the body's swimming muscles, while the other goes to the VO. However, the copy sent to the VO arrives slightly ahead of the signal sent to the relevant muscles in order to calibrate the organ and prepare the body for motion. This feed-forward principle is crucial, and if the timing were off even by the slightest, then the system would disrupt balance instead of helping it. ICR science writer Brian Thomas asks the right question. 
How could a system with this kind of exquisite timing, the brain, brainstem, spinal cord, spine, ear, VO, neurons, and muscles, all working in exacting and concerted harmony to make seamless locomotion, have originated? According to team scientist and lead author Dr. Boris Chognod, here evolution has not only come up with an elegant means of anticipating the effects of locomotion on the body, but also of compensating for them in an adaptive fashion. However, as Thomas and many others have pointed out, natural forces never anticipate. They cannot think ahead because they do not have minds, will, or volition. However, intelligent minds can anticipate. Never do we see nature inventing such sophisticated machinery, but we do see actual designers do it. Therefore, the only logical and straightforward conclusion is that it was an intelligent mind behind this incredible design and not evolution. Thank you, Ryan, for that piece. Now, you, you know, being my children, that uh, the inner ear issue, I've mm -hmm. had problems myself with the inner ear. Yeah, it creates all sorts of issues. Yes, I've had to uh, go into swimming pools with braces on and everything else. I've, I, think I, got, <laughs> I think I got it straightened out, though. That's good. But anyway, <laughs> you know, in the last part of my life. But anyway, the, the Lord is, and it's not evolution. No, it's Because not. there's no way it can be evolution when it's that complex and it's that sophisticated. There's just no way it can be. Because the problem is, then if it's evolution, then you've got a big problem with the design of it and all that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, here's Call the Prayer. One critical thing when we pray and ask God for an answer to our prayer is to be ready and aware in our heart if something is revealed to be wrong. God has people he's working with and they willingly submit to his changes. This difference is from the person who is not working with him and does not allow their life and their soul to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We must be people willing and ready for change whenever God speaks. The important thing to remember is that the Lord is alive and that He has promised and He's brought you this program and He's told you that in His Word He came 2,000 years ago and He died on the cross and He rose again by Himself in the flesh on the third day. And he sits now at the right hand of the Father and sends his Holy Spirit to help us. Come to Jesus today. Ask him to take your life and make it his in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs>